with the introduction of LLMs and AI, mm -hmm. it's 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 going to play a huge. Um, it's going to have a huge positive effect on XGR, right? I think it allows us to take advantage of these emerging technologies, and at the same time, being able to ask the right questions, right? As you've seen, like you know, with with the applications like ChatGPT and 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 a few others that are out there, it's 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 like you're asking a vast you you're pumping vast amounts of data, and you're trying to ask the questions to be able to get these answers. And I think the security professionals and these different platforms can totally leverage these tools to be able to ask the right questions, to be able to you know, get the right answers and protect the, um, you know, these companies from cyber attacks. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Future of Security Operations podcast. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Adam Khan. Adam is a cybersecurity and technology leader with over 25 years of experience working at Fortune 500 companies. He has a proven track record of building and managing global security teams, leading engineering, infrastructure, application, and product. And he is currently the VP of Global Security Operations at Barracuda. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for having me here. Looking forward to our discussion. Me too. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about your history and your, your switch into security, you made the switch from a long time in the secure, like SRE, the site reliability engineering team at Priceline to SecOps at Scout and Barracuda. Can you talk to me about the experiences at Priceline and how they influence how you currently run a global SOC? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the role of an SRE is a very unique role uh, because you get basically exposure to all facets of technology, right? Mm -hmm. Being an SRE, you have to know how web servers work. You have to know how networking is. You have to know about firewalls. You have to know about databases. You have to know about automation. You have to know about coding, right? Um, and on coupled of it, it's kind of like all branched out and then you have to be a security expert as well. So that role really allowed me to have variety of skill sets to be able to take that throughout my career and especially when I got to uh, scout to be able to you know get talented folks with variety of skills you know working together uh, to solve uh, and protect our customers so as a uh, I suppose as, as an SRE your job did have like a bunch of security security elements is that what attracted you is that what attracted you to security or what was it what was it that you know gave you the gave you the itch that you wanted to move into this area yeah definitely so this is a well-known fact there was a pretty massive attack uh, against priceline and aws uh, back in 2000 uh, i believe eight so uh that actually got me really interested so uh, an attacker uh, basically DDoSed multiple companies. It was Verizon, AWS, uh, it was Amazon and uh, Priceline and a few others. And uh, it was using a variety of botnets um, and they were coming from everywhere, even though we had a few other companies that offered mitigations at that time. I had to basically kind of build in multiple automation scripts as they were bringing down some of our infrastructure and causing uh, high traffic to be mm -hmm. able to handle that load. And it really got me interested in, you know, thinking from an adversarial perspective, right? What are the type of attacks they execute? And, um, you know, and then came various projects from like handling cross-site scripting and on, on web servers and things like that. So uh, having the variety of skills across the different infrastructure and kind of having that mindset of, you know, these things can be extremely damaging to businesses. Um, and uh, that's how it, I really became interested in security as well. Yeah, it's kind of funny that the skill set maps extremely well. Uh, as in, as a security professional, you're in, yeah, in a SOC, you're often thrown in the deep end in incidents where you're told like, hey, something's happened on this particular server and you don't have any, or with this particular tool, and you don't have any knowledge about that. You have to kind of figure it out from first principles. Um, the thing that I 
I've really enjoyed when I worked with SRE teams in the past is their calmness in incidents. Is in like incidents is the job, right? right? So did any of that, I suppose, resilience when dealing with uh, like, uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, a massive DDoS taking in the side, but you know, Hey, this, you know, we have to roll back because this particular feature is, but you know, breaking this particular part of the website or whatever, or the application, did any of that resilience, uh, like help you in, or does any of that, res- that training help you in your current role? Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, you know, working in that role, we worked with multiple other, um, uh, you know, uh, members within our uh, infrastructure team. So whether it be database and, and uh, developers, and mm-hmm. there's constant development, right? There's constant pushing out of code uh, and new features onto the website. Every morning, uh, I remember that we would have a deployment phase which started out at like 6 a.m. and ended at nine, and it was all hands on deck. And it was a method and, you know, and, and a discipline to it, right? We mm-hmm. were following step by step, you know, this code change got pushed and then we would see in real time, what is it doing to a traffic? How is it being handled? Um, you know, and seeing any uh, exceptions and errors on our side, making sure our infrastructure is being able to handle the, you know, the new change and stuff. And if there is any rollback, we would catch it right away. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, something that I've kind of leveraged in those disciplines, um, you know, in my, in my current job as well. And uh, a lot of things that uh, with with the SRE role that comes with is you have to be sharp at all hours of the day. Yeah. Right. We were on call at whenever the infrastructure had downtime and, you know, things like that. So uh, we would get calls at 2 a.m. Hey, you know, certain components of uh, the database is having an issue or some component of our application servers. And you had to know each of these and, you know, how to go about hunt and look for these. And it's similar to like cybersecurity, like you're hunting in logs, right? To identify these security threats. So um, yeah, I believe it's uh, been a huge help for me in my career. Yeah, you're also relying uh, um, a lot on like, it's, it's not, I'm always wary when I say you should be relying on like your gut or spidey senses, but a lot of the time you are relying on your gut and your spidey senses being like, hey, I think this could have something to do with this thing over here that we pushed right. or something like that that's causing these performance issues. And it's really, um, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's hard. Um, I suppose uh, like Priceline, I'm an absolutely enormous brand, but like you were, yeah, like you're protecting a whole lot of confidential customer information, but also credit card information, you're managing vulnerabilities. When you think about, and uh, I'd love to give a quick, or I'd love you to give a quick background to Skate and Barracuda. When you're thinking about, uh, I suppose, that aspect of your role, does that impact how you're advising any of your customers today? Do you treat them any differently based on what they're, yeah, what, what they're, um, yeah, what they're offering, what they're doing, what their uh, core competencies are? Yeah, I mean, it it does, right? Because that experience has kind of really helped because uh, allowing me, there's a variety of customers we have, right? Um, mm-hmm. We have uh, small and mid-sized businesses who have, um, you know, some of them are small teams, right? And, and mm-hmm. they lack the security experience and they're focused on kind of growing their business and managing the infrastructure. So security kind of comes as something that's, you know, uh, they're not as familiar with and um, you know those experiences and sharing with them what are the you know right principles on when you're building you know some a server or when mm-hmm. you're hardening some uh, security tool uh, so yeah like that really helps in kind of showing them and, and uh, exploring these these new adoption of technologies uh, as they work with us and um, just so folks are Aware and also potentially for a bit of a plug, what, what's the relationship between uh, Scout and Barracuda, and how did that, uh, I suppose, how, how did that come about? So yeah, we got uh, acquired. I believe now it's been maybe three and a half years. I don't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, well, it was it was a, a you know an opportunity for Barracuda mm-hmm. to you know um, kind of uh, adopt XDR into mm-hmm. their platform they definitely saw a big need for it and uh we you know we were the right partner for us it's, there was great uh, culture that barracuda has and that scout had so everything kind of 
merged and it's been a huge success. I love it. Um, when I think about uh, XGR, I'm thinking about like network security, endpoint security, email security, and like those meshing together. Um, obviously, you've got like small and medium size customers. For those medium sized customers, what's the value of having an external XDR platform and how, how do you communicate the success to those customers? Yeah, definitely. I think the, the biggest value is we, we all in security know, and it is the shortage of talent and the yeah. lack of knowledge in security, right? Uh, being that, uh, you know, it's hard to find security professionals who I just kind of talked about. You have yeah. to know pretty much everything, right? Across this tech stack, having those types of skill sets um, and, you know, acquiring them becomes rapidly, you know, quickly expensive, right? For these companies who are trying to grow their business. Um, so yeah, leveraging an external company who does this as, as their core competency allows them mm -hmm. to kind of utilize their full tech stack, the, you know, their uh, security teams to kind of add them to their own, um, you know, company as 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 we cohesively work together. So it's a massive benefits to a lot of these small and mid-sized businesses to be able to protect themselves against cybersecurity attacks. Uh, how um, I suppose how closely do you work with them? How like how custom is it for each individual customer? That one of the like interesting aspects that I've seen in XUR is that like it's you you know deploy a tool. But a lot of the time it's, you know, my, what's important for me isn't necessarily important for, you know, company B. How, how do you, I suppose, how do you, how do you at Barracuda think about that? Uh, like the different risks facing different customers. Yeah. So there's obviously there's some nuances to each uh, customer. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, one of, one of the things is there's, 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 although there's some differences, there's a lot of similarities, right. Mm -hmm. With a lot of the, mid-sized and small businesses and especially MSPs who are adopting, you know, cloud technology, right? They are in Office 365 and that there are massive shops there, right? Uh, so there is some consolidation happening there, right? Definitely. They're utilizing Azure. So for us to kind of know and build these profiles ahead of time um, that we have like all sorts of detection rules for these different uh, major vendors and the learnings we've had from the past um, that augmented us to get to the state where we are only, you know, providing valuable information to our customers. We're not spamming them with thousands of alerts that are not valuable, right? And uh, this this kind of really helps us, like, kind of succeeding with them and making sure they're protected. How do you how do you go about that? Like, that, and this is a this is a question for all security professionals. But how do you go about like whittling down the thousand of alerts to the relevant five or ten for yeah, a particular customer. Yeah, it's it's uh, is uh, you know utilizing technology is 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 a big part of us, right? Like uh, we're utilizing Tynes, and, and it's a massive, uh, 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 basically a very important piece in our security infrastructure, um, and it allows us to not only you know enrich our threat intelligence, but to root out false positives. Uh, we're ingesting like billions and billions of events, right? Out of those, every security tool that these customers have, firewalls, endpoints, whatever it is, this create a lot of noise, right? And and you can't have, you know, security teams look through those. We just don't have, no one in the world has this type of manpower, right? And to augment tools like Tynes with the security expertise and, you know, um, threat intelligence and automation to be able to not just send relevant information, but also take action in real time. Um, and it's been a, a massive help uh, to us and our, and our customers as well. The, inst the response times has, has uh, drastically reduced because of uh, implementation of times as well. I love to hear it. And thanks for the, uh, th thanks for the shout out. We're always like, obviously the relationship is very strong, but we love working with the, the team. They're easily some of the sharpest professionals we have the, the pleasure to work with. Um, I suppose when you when you're thinking about like when you're thinking about what you're doing at the moment and you're thinking about like the data that you have, uh, obviously you're an XDR platform, but how do you see the like 
I don't see data decreasing. How do you see it? Like, I suppose meshing together better to give an overview of an organization's security posture in the future. And I know you've written some, uh, some blogs on AI. Do you think AI is part of that or what, like, where do you, where do you see the, where do you see the, yeah. the data problem, think, the alert problem going? Yeah, I think, I think it's not going to reduce. Uh, I definitely don't see that. I see, you know, uptakes year over year. I think, uh, you know, with the introduction of LLMs and AI, mm -hmm. it's 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 going to play a huge. Um, it's going to have a huge positive effect on XGR, right? I think it allows us to take advantage of these emerging technologies, and at the same time, being able to ask the right questions, right? As you've seen, like you know, with with the applications like ChatGPT and and, and and a few others that are out there, it's 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 like you're asking a vast you you're pumping vast amounts of data and you're trying to ask the questions to be able to get these answers. And I think the security professionals and these different platforms can totally leverage these tools to be able to ask the right questions, to be able to, you know, get the right answers and protect the. Um, you know, these companies from cyber attacks. And I think it, uh, on the flip side, I think you're going to have adversaries also take advantage of this technology as well, right? So I think there's going to be a massive push across every industry uh, to adopt AI and LLMs. Yeah, I I, I saw the, um, this will definitely date the podcast for when it's coming out, but there was a recent, uh, I suppose, recent attack there where somebody used it like deep fakes to launch a $25 million social engineering against somebody uh, yeah, somebody, I don't know, somebody on the procurement team for some company who shipped twenty five million dollars to a to an attacker, or which is terrible. But what what are the like? That's not something. That's I, I hope training and processes. It's not something that's easy for an XDR platform to detect. But what are some of the, um, you know, what are some of the threats you think or you've seen using AI, or have you seen any uh, like smart attacks using AI uh, that yeah that attackers are doing? Yeah, I mean. We haven't seen anything with one of our customers yet, okay. um, but, you know, kind of doing your, uh, my own research and stuff, you've seen new, uh, call it, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of fraud GBT, uh, which actually fraudulently kind of mimics, yeah. you know, email phishing campaigns and you've heard of warm GBT and there's a few others that are coming into the picture. Um, I think again, this, this is where I would say, we're at the infancy stage of AI, uh, even though it seems like, oh my God, we're, we've gotten so far. Um, but I think more and more as we go into the a couple of years, we'll, we'll definitely start uh, seeing this and we'll definitely start seeing uh, a, a larger uptake with these attacks being successful. Um, yeah, I was reading through your global threat report, uh, which you wrote, which uh, we'll put a link in the link in the show notes. And it talked about that. It talked about like, yeah, worm GPT for for all GPT, evil GPT. You also still talked about like this, and I'll talk about uh, the the history of a uh, history of security in a second. But you talked about, I suppose, the just the ever remaining threats of like phishing and social engineering supply chain attacks, as well as like the continued dominance of well i suppose the growth in uh, and dominance of ransomware well, i suppose when you're yeah when you're thinking about this year do you think that's going to be it's going to be the same any big changes uh in like ransomware and phishing and supply chain attacks or are they just ever present and gonna not gonna change yeah i, I think the industry is has gotten used to it that this is the norm the only change is going to be like an uptick right you're going to continuously see this and you have both, you know, on, on both sides, I think on, on the security side, um, we're getting smarter. And at the mm -hmm. same time, you're having these attackers are also uh, finding evasive techniques um, to kind of get around these different security measures. So it's going to be a constant battle. I think uh, there's a lot of great uh, professionals out there in the security space who are, who are doing good work. So uh, it's definitely something that I look at something that I'm I'm proud to be a part of the community and um you know we're kind of all moving forward and trying to do the right thing. Um you're I think you're being very modest there. You're part of the community, but you're also like you're shaping it. You've yeah, you're a prolific uh prolific author and content uh kind of generator. But what what are the things that you wrote 
recently and again we'll some uh provide some links in the uh in the show notes you wrote it like pretty much an entire history of cybersecurity, a blog series spanning each decade of the 80s, 90s, noughties, the 10s or the 10s, right. teens and the, yeah. uh, and now like when, what's your big takeaway after writing a history of, a history of cybersecurity and how, did you learn anything that will shape any strategy for you or for Scout Barracuda in the future? Yeah, uh, yeah. First of all, like I kind of wrote that, uh, and I came up with the idea. Was one because it's important to know, you know, where we come from. Yeah, and and the journey we've taken and and where we've gotten to, right? Um, for, like the three biggest takeaways for me was the continuous learning is an imperative to I think just in security in general, mm-hmm. um, and and then adapting and kind of keeping pace of how technology has so rapidly um, changed in front of our eyes. Like I, I remember when when I first started kind of um, working my first job, it was in the dot-com boom. And, you know, uh, a little bit before that, we still had, you know, uh, modems that we were logging in from and things like that. And to, to now it's, we complain when things are not downloaded in a millisecond, right? Or like, hey, what's going on? And uh, yeah, and then at the same time, the world has become, you know, a lot closer mm-hmm. in one, one sense, but at the same time, it's a part because we think of our social media, it's like, oh my God, it's brought so many people together, right? And we could respond and keep in touch. But at the same time, we're kind of like in this digital realm where we hardly call people, right? So I think my uh, number one learning uh, is is continuous learning and kind of advancing there. And I think um, from number two would be kind of leveraging these technologies to, to actually take action, uh, not just kind of, hey, I learned about AI. Hey, I learned about LLMs or, you know, zero day, but actually try to take actions and, and put it into practice in your organization, right? Uh, how it can help us. Um, whether it's on, you know, not just security side, whether it's on sales or customer service, whatever it is, I think uh, utilizing um, these technologies to be able to do those is is very important. And I think uh, last thing is like the, the, the talent that has grown in cybersecurity, even though there's still a shortage, is is massive. The, the, the security space to me is is consists of amazingly talented individuals and and mm-hmm. then it's almost, it is a community, believe it or not. The, the amount of threat intelligence and research that is shared by multiple individuals, companies, right? Whenever there is a zero day, you know, you know, you see indicators of compromise being published and shared in the community where other people can can take advantage of those and, and understand different attacks. Um, and I think to, to me, like, I, you know, I don't think they get the credit that they deserve and, you know, and the work they do on the day-to-day uh, basis. So it's something, those those three things are my biggest learnings from those. Yeah, I, I, I it's, there's, there's way too much to, uh, way too much to di- dive in on there, but I definitely, yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, I, first of all, massively respect those people that are like that, the companies that support it, but also the people that do talk openly about their experiences in, uh, in incidents and not just like what went right, because l- some go right but some go terribly wrong and it's okay to talk about that as well we've all been part of incidents that have not uh not gone well but knowing that the microsoft security team can mess up uh makes it a lot easier for those organizations who are not as well resourced to be able to uh to be able to yeah you can talk openly about it and learn from right. from them as well and um, you kind of you touched on the, the talent gap there uh, and i know you've talked about this a little bit before, but how do you, I suppose, what are some of the strategies you think we can use to tackle the talent shortage in security? And what are you doing uh, for your teams to to help that? Yeah, I think there's, to me, I've kind of fundamentally uh, followed and, and been successful with the three pillars of security, right? You think about the people, process, and technology, mm-hmm. right? Those three aspects really has helped us build our global security stock. So one kind of recognizing 
what I talked about, uh, different skill sets of individuals, right? Um, when you're building a team, you need to kind of look at the different aspects and the skill sets these individuals have. Like you could have a developer on your team, on your security team that has actually great at coding, right? And somebody who's great at like administering or great at uh, recognizing different types of threats. But if you put them together, the knowledge sharing and the and the skill sets that are kind of uh, passed on mm -hmm. are really massive, right? And And it really helps kind of building uh, the team, right? And and the other thing is like SOCs and global SOCs are very process oriented, right? Yeah. Um, heavily on, on run books and things like that. So having, you know, full documented processes that, that the team is following really helps there as well. And from the technology perspective, uh, solving the, uh, the talent gap, uh, you know, again, kind of, leveraging the right tools to be able to allow this, uh, I would say the, the system to do what it does best and allowing the security to, to do what it does best to be able to help you scale rapidly um, and only kind of focus on uh, you know what's relevant. I think those key things are, are I would say, help in, in addressing the talent gap. Uh, I suppose, how do you look after the team? Like uh, somebody that manages a a global SOC for thousands of organizations, it's yeah, it's imperative to make sure that your like your team aren't burned out. How, how do you go about uh, yeah, making sure that they're able to do their best work? Yeah, so we are very cognizant of this, right? So um, it's important for us to manage their schedules. So we have a very yeah. uh, flexible schedule that they kind of work on, and there's there's ample time and days off. Uh, mm -hmm. that they uh, that they can utilize to kind of reset themselves and also we we allow them to kind of continuously learn we we give them opportunities to you know online platforms to kind of do their uh, own self learning and we also uh, utilize various the internal meetings to be able to train our uh, analysts and our engineers from all different aspects of security tools and things like that so and then uh, you know you have the normal i would say it's important to get togethers right where you yeah. meet on a consistent basis you share ideas and <clears throat> my thing has always been you know building uh, leaders building leaders right um allowing the space for the team to kind of look at the problems they're facing day to day and coming up with the solutions right and and utilizing um like you know, our North Star, which we always talk about at Barracuda is like think customer, right? What yeah. what are the what are the pain points our customers are having, right? And and utilizing whether it's uh, you know, if we could attack them uh, or or solve these problems with technology, or you know, just having you know a conversation with the customer and making sure they're they're addressed. Um, so I think it kind of allows us to to take these aspects and, and making sure our teams are well taken care of and uh, they're in a happy state because, you know, it's, it's hard to do this work, as I said earlier. And, um, and, but at the same time, it's very gratifying and we're in a, you know, we're grateful to be in this, in this space, right? I think everybody in my team definitely recognizes that and uh, they have the freedom to kind of expand and, you know, uh, utilize their, their intellect and their ideas to uh, solve problems. Ultimately, that's what uh, everyone wants. Yeah, it sounds like a both for customers and for internal em employees, an extremely caring organization. Uh, and yeah, that's the key to it's going to be the key to long term success for 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 anybody. And um, you also continuously grow and learn, and like again, like you know, what I like uh, investigations into the history of cybersecurity, a global threat report, um, and yeah, a whole load more. How, how do you, how do you learn? How do you go about keeping on top of uh, like trend, trends in cybersecurity and who, who do you learn from? That yeah, great question. So I actually uh, read a lot, just different publications that are out there. Um, you know, there's so many, uh, Bleeping Computer, you name it, there's, there's dark reading, there's there's mat and multiple ones. So I constantly read. And I think there's also um, 
you know, I think YouTube is such a great tool. You know, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's it has information about everything, right? And it's it's a massive asset to you know any profession, I would say. Um, so I think that's been a big leverage for for me as well. Um, so yeah, those those would be the two biggest levers. And I I, I am a I'm a I would say, I like to tinker things all the time. Uh, so I'm always playing around with tools and and kind of researching and and coding on my myself and building little apps and kind of seeing you know what what type of results and outputs and uh, I get and it's something that I enjoy and it's constantly learning kind of keeping in space right like learning about AI like how it works and not just you know uh, doing that so. Nice. It's nice thing you get excited. Uh, get excited about it. It's um, yeah. That's it's great. I I've not like when I, when I ask that question, a lot of people say, it, dark reading is very popular. Bleeping computers very popular. But a lot of people say Twitter is very popular. But I haven't heard a lot of people say, or I haven't heard a lot of people say YouTube. So is there any like, yeah? If if somebody's listening, if somebody's you know either starting their career in cybersecurity or is, yeah, managing a global SOC, what like are any good resources that you can shout out that like we should check out? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't remember the channels on top of my head, but I think just there's so many like webinars or podcasts on YouTube yeah. about on a weekly basis. Uh, like this is exactly what I talked about, the cybersecurity community, right? They talk yeah. about various threats that are happening, how they affected companies and what were the gaps within these companies and uh, what are the, you know, kind of mitigation actions they took or what are the learnings. I think there's a lot of good resources um, on YouTube just in general. And there's also uh, training on, you know, how to go about kind of setting up a lab, doing a hacking exercise in your lab and things like that. So you you, you really can take advantage of it uh, from, from those uh, videos on YouTube. Yeah. Um, what are some... Uh, what are some future tinkering projects you have? Anything uh, anything exciting that you, that you plan to work on? Uh, right now I'm kind of, uh, definitely look, you know, kind of working on this, uh, you know, in the security space and utilizing AI to augment some, some vulnerability stuff that it is a small little project that I'm working on, but yeah. Okay. Um, no, I'm always, it's always fun to, I suppose, explore that, uh, explore that other side that people are, people are playing with uh, a previous guest. Um, uh, Mandy was, yeah, she basically was just exactly exa same like previously she had her own lab and would just like tinker with a whole load of security products and just like set them up play around and you know do some re reviews and it was it just sounded uh it sounded fascinating um so kind of like so speaking of uh speaking of learning experiences I, I really like asking folks is there anything that you look back on and think you know hey if i was to do this all over again i know what i'd do differently yeah you mean like in career wise, right? Yeah, well, career wise, sort of, like, you know, hey, setting up a setting up a sock, you know, setting up a threat intelligence center, or like you've got a ton of experience. Anything that you'd be like, oh, yeah. actually, I made some, not necessarily, I made some mistakes. It's just like I, I know how I know how I do this. If I was thinking right. again, I, I think I think those I think those mistakes are very important. Yeah, I think those you know, uh, you know, when people see oh, you know. Me okay, I'm the you know uh, VP of Global Security, and and they get amazed. But there's a lot of failures that have happened before that, right? And I think mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I am, or I think the team wouldn't be where it is uh, if we didn't have those those failures. And I think to a certain extent, I would say you know you somebody would say, oh you know if yep. I can avoid this failure or that failure or whatever it is, I would be in a, such a different place. But you wouldn't have the learnings, right? You wouldn't yep. have the struggle. To get to where you are today and 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 be sophisticated as where we are when it comes to our maturity of our sock right um and our team so i honestly wouldn't change anything like like i talked about even at price sign all the uh you know hundreds of on calls and late nights that uh you know when the stuff was uh breaking down and and getting getting to resolve those those are all uh learnings for me and and continue to keep learning. So I wouldn't, honestly, I would not change anything. Um, you know, there's always learning. It's just. Um, it's a very leading question here. So internally, do you have a, like an, uh, an, a culture of like 
blameless, uh, uh, like blameless reviews, blameless. Uh, why can't I think of the? Uh, why can't I think of the? Uh, the word like, I suppose yeah, blameless reviews of incidents. I'm just yeah, brain, yeah, brain yeah. on the well, word. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely yeah, it's an important fact, right? Because I think you know we you know there's we succeed together as a as a team, and yeah. you know, there's issues or some some things do happen we, we fail together as a team so it's not uh, on one particular individual and it's very important in security to kind of keep that mindset right um mm-hmm. whatever we do it's a collective mindset uh a success of you know uh, of a certain project or certain delivery or certain type of detections that caught mm-hmm. you know attackers and whatever it is uh, is something that we all kind of succeed in. It's it's something that you kind of have to keep driving. But I think at the same time, we hold ourselves all accountable, right? We are mm-hmm. all accountable as a team to be able to make sure we're protecting our customers, to be, be able to make sure we're following our processes, to be, be make sure we're, we're providing great service to our customers. So we take that very seriously. Yeah, um, of course. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what we do. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's something that, we have kind of baked into our culture, like, you know, um, succeed together, whatever we do, we're succeeding together. Um, when you think about, yeah, when you think about the, the future of security uh, and you think about uh, like, Hey, what the, what the threat landscape is going to look like in a few years time. Uh, what do you think a good SOC, what do you think a, a good security operations team will look like in four or five years? What are you, what are you planning for? I think uh, it it will continue its trajectory on the three prin- the three principles yeah. that I talked about, right? I think technology is going to keep adapting. I think every SOC will have to kind of take advantage of uh, this emerging technology of AI. And I think it will mm-hmm. really couple and augment a SOC to, to kind of elevate their maturity to even uh, a higher level. Um, and I think that's one of the things we, we are kind of focusing on as we head into the future, how do we uh, utilize AI to to kind of better ourselves when it comes to detecting these anomalies and these security threats? So I'm super excited about the future and what what it brings. Brilliant. Um, unfortunately, Adam, that's all we're going to have time for. But if people want to follow you, follow your future, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, uh, if you if you want to follow me uh, personally, my website is adamkhancyber. Uh, dot com and if you want to reach out at uh, barracuda is sales uh, at msp at uh, barracuda.com brilliant look thank you so much for joining me and i yeah i hope we have you on again at some stage in the future thank you thomas really appreciate it